Hi, this is Maggie from Design Code Debug Repeat. Thank you for stopping by my channel. Today we're going to do something really fun, and that's look at five different things that we can do with Pygame.mask. So I have a little demo program here, and most of what we do we're going to illustrate within this program. So this is what it looks like running, and I got this wonderful art on opengameart.org. It was created by Christoph, and I will include a link in the description. So we have these sprites, and all that we can do is move them around. Now, uh, they're sort of jumbled up, so actually it looks like the envelope was on top. And this illustrates perfectly what we don't want to happen. I've clicked within the rectangle of this envelope, and I'm able to move it by clicking basically near it. Oh, there I get the map. I was trying to get the bottle. You can see that we can click just near these things because we're within the bounding rectangle. And that's not what we want. We want to be able to click only on the set bits or the, the pixels that are colored or not transparent. And this is the most obvious use of masks. So this program, just a quick overview, I've made click into a sprite so I can use sprite collide. So that's just the location of the click. And item is the sprite which is just an item that we can move around. And you can see it's quite simple. Basically, it just deals with mouse down to mouse up and mouse motion. So down in the event handling, I'm using Sprite Collide to determine if when we click, if that collides with one of the items in that items group, so one of those sprites. And the default method for determining if there is an overlap between this sprite and this group of sprites, or any sprite in this group of sprites, is to use the bounding rectangle. Um, let's take a look at the documentation. Okay, so here's Sprite Collide, and you can see that I haven't passed anything in for this named parameter, Collided, and the default is none. This is the method or function that's used to determine whether there's an overlap between Sprite and any of the sprites in group. And you can write your own method for that, but, or function for that, but there are a lot of functions that are already written, and the one that we want to use is Collide Mask because that will determine if there's a collision between the set bits of the sprite and any sprite in the group. So what we're going to do is set collided equal to this collide mask function. Now we're not calling the function, we're passing it. So you don't put parentheses after that. We're basically passing the address of the function to sprite collide so that sprite collide can call it. Now we're going to do a little bit more to make it a little more efficient. But with just that one change, see I'm clicking in white space that's around my sprites. Where I could click before, it's not working though. I have to click directly on a part of the sprite, so part that's drawn, one of the set bits. I can't click anywhere else. So that's the first use that's the most common use of a mask. Let's just make it a little bit more efficient because what this is going to do is create a mask for the sprites every time that we call Sprite Collide. And we can speed that up a little bit by creating the mask in the initializer. So just like image and rect, um, it has a mask attribute that we can set. And let's go and look at what we're going to want to use. We can create a mask from a surface. So we can create the mask from the image, which is a, a surface. Okay, so. And we could pass in image or self.image. Okay. So that's not going to give us any uh, change that we're going to notice, but it's more, let's make sure it still works. Okay, that one was on top. It's more efficient because we're not now creating a mask every single time. Okay, but the thing to understand about creating your own mask is if there's any transformation of the sprite, so the sprite's uh, image. So for example, if we were to rotate it or scale it, then we would need to recreate that mask. So what I thought would be kind of funny is if when we release the sprites, when we drop it, let's go ahead and, and scale it. So let's make it uh, half as big. So every time you pick one of these things up and drop them, they change size. And when we do that, we will create the new mask.
Okay, so we're, we're going to scale it um, and we're going to want to relocate it so that it appears to um, scale down towards its center. So we're going to get the old location. So um, I guess loc. And then we'll set the new, we have to get the new rect from the newly sized image and we'll set that to be at the new location. And then we're going to want to create that new mask. So um, let's try it without uh, changing the mask at first. Okay, so when we pick things up and drop them, they change in size. Now I can see I can still grab it in the same place where it was because I didn't change the mask. Can't grab it now. Now I don't know where the mask is. Okay, uh, so let's put that back where we're changing the mask. This one was a good example. Oh, nope, I'm still on it. Let's try this one. Okay, yeah, I can no longer move it by clicking in that same location. Okay. So that's number one, collision detection. Remember to pass in to the collided parameter, pygame.sprite.collidemask, when you check for collisions. Remember to set the mask by creating the mask from the image in the initializer. And then also remember, anytime that you might change the image of your sprite, for example, rotating, or if you've got an animated sprite and it will change, right, um, its features as it's animating, you want to also change that mask. All right, number two is creating a shadow. So one thing that I like to do is um, to illustrate which item is being picked up by giving it a shadow. And I had that in the Tangram game. And you can see some remnants of that, um, right? Let's see. I have this effect group, which I pass in on handle mouse down. That's the group, it's going to have the shadow in it. Um, we might have a different effect later. Um, so previously I was adding the shadow when, when this was the Tangram game um, to this effect group so that it would get drawn. And then when this is put down, the shadow is removed but we don't have a shadow yet. So I do have this shadow class, which is quite simple. Um, and what we're going to do is let's get rid of that. So shadow just basically moves around with the object. It doesn't do anything else. So what we're going to do is we're going to create the shadow here in the initializer, and then we'll be able to add it on mouse down to the shadow group. And you can see down here um, that the shadow group or, or effect group rather um, clears, updates, and draws. So normally, there, right now, there's nothing in it. Um, but once we pick up an item, we want to put the item shadow in it. And we can make a shadow for our item by getting its mask and then turning that back into a surface. So we're going to call the shadow initializer. Um, it just needs its image and its location. Okay, so we're going to use this mask to surface. Let's look at that. So this can create a new surface and, and we don't have to pass anything in. But what we might want to do is set the color of the bits that are set and then the color of the unset bits. So in other words, where we have, let's, um, so uh, for example, with the book, so anywhere that we have set bits, that's where we want shadow. We don't want the whole rectangle turned into the shadow. So we just want to have the set bits turned a color, like for example, um, a, a black or a gray. And then we want that to have some transparency so that when we move it over other items, we see a shadow um, you know, over the other items or over the background where it's moving. And so we'll want to offset it a little bit as well. So we're going to pass in a set color and I'm going to make that black. Full opacity and unset color equal to none. And then for the location, 
we'll just offset it by 10, which is going to look weird when our when our shadows or, or our um, items resize. Let's see. I had set the alpha up and I think I will put that back. Okay, so it's it, this is full opacity, but then um, we'll set the alpha. I mean, can we set it here? Let, let's try setting it here instead. And then we don't have to do that. Um, I'm not sure where we want that control. Okay, and then the unset color to none means we're not going to draw the any of the bits that aren't set, so that don't have an image. Okay, so let's see how that looks. Oops, that is in the wrong location. They're all always going to the same place. Okay, what's happening? Oh, we forgot to give it, or we gave it the wrong location. Self.rec.x shadow loc self.rec.top left equals loc Are we setting that before we actually set? Yes, okay, so <laughs> whoops. That doesn't have a value yet. Okay, let's just use uh, X and Y. Try again. There we go. Oopsie. And now we forgot to move it. <laughs> forgot to move it along. Okay. So um, uh, handle mouse motion. Oh, look. It used to be there. Um, when we resize, we should uh, recreate our shadow as well. So why don't we just go ahead and do that. And here we can use. And really, instead of offsetting by 10 or any other um, hard-coded amount, we should do a percentage that's going to look good. But this is just about making a shadow. You can figure out the niceties. Okay, so we can see, yeah, I like that. And yeah, there we have one that's offset a little less, but now it's gonna stay at five. But yeah, so that's number two. We can make a shadow. Now, for number three, this is similar to the shadow, we can make a glow. So let's create another class called glow, which is going to be very similar to shadow, except with a glow, we're really going to want to locate it centrally. So um, instead of being offset, so instead of getting the top left, we're going to want to get the center. So basically it's the same thing. Um, in fact, why don't we subclass shadow? Yeah, because we can still move it in the same way. Um, so let's subclass shadow and then in init, we'll call super init with image um, and location, but then we'll just um, fix the location. So self.rec.center equals location. There, that saved us some some programming some copy paste which we should avoid all right so instead of having a shadow when we pick the item up we're going to have a glow so we'll add that to the effect group um, instead of the shadow so let's let's just add another field called the glow um, and that way we can just um, we can even create it again so let's see yeah, we'll just uh, create it again here. So we move, we'll move both the shadow and the glow, but we'll probably only show one of them. So that's whatever we add to the effect group. So we're gonna add the glow. So we need to create it. So for the glow, um, what I would like is for it to be brighter near the center, right, and then to have uh, um, higher transparency near the edges. So I'm going to write a method to create the glow. So here we'll say self.glow equals self.makeglow. Okay, self.glow, okay, good. All right, so how are we going to make a glow? Um, so we're going to, first of all, uh, create a mask surface and um, you can make your glow any color you want. I think I'm going to make mine yellow so I'm going to make it all red, oops, all green, no blue, 
and um, I'm going to make this surface with a very um, low alpha value and um, then I'm going to layer on top of it so that I'll make smaller ones and layer them on top so that on the inside there are more layers will have um, less transparency. Okay, and then for the unset color, none. Okay, so we're, we're making a surface, but instead of making it gray, like we did with the shadow, we're making it this very transparent yellow or whatever color you want. Maybe different kinds of objects should glow with different colors. Okay, and um, then we're going to scale that. And you'll have to, you know, play around and see what size um, looks good. Well, this is 30% larger. So what I'm going to do now, I've, I've created the, the sort of the base, um, which is scaled uh, the 30%. And now I'm going to iterate 10 times. Um, I don't want to take too much time because this is sort of a time consuming thing that I'm doing here, but I suppose we could iterate more. We're doing this once in setup, not a big deal. Um, but if our images are going to keep changing, we're going to have to keep creating glows. So, you know, maybe, maybe you, you want to keep the um, resource consumption down here. So I'm, I'm keeping it down to 10. So I'm going to use the scale factor to make in increasingly larger um, pieces to, or, or surfaces to blit onto the original glow surface. Now that we've made that, we're just going to blit it. Um, I don't know why I put an underscore there. We're just going to blit it to, you know, the, the largest, the, the outermost glow. And we want that centered. Okay, let's annotate a few of those variables. Let's see, what do we have? We have mask surface, glow, and we have inner glow. scale and I. Okay, I find it easier to read code if I know what data type things are that I'm looking at. Um, so I think that's everything. All right, so that's a glow. Um, and we're setting that to self.glow. And instead of adding the um, shadow to the effect group, we'll now add the glow to the effect group. Um, now I'm not fixing it when we scale. I guess I should do that um, on mouse up. All right, let's see. Where have I made errors? Okay, so there's my glow, and you can see the gradient. Oh, I think that looks pretty cool. I don't know. Okay, well, let's see if I scaled it successfully. Yeah. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so that was number three. Make a glow. Okay, um, so for the next one, um, this is the last one I'm going to do in here. We're going to look at how can we use masks to figure out if one part of a sprite has overlapped with another part of a sprite. So for this, I'm going to use a different image and I want to show you the images. All right, so here's another one of those wonderful images by Christoph, and this is a weapon. It has sharp parts, so I thought, um, let's have a mask for just the sharp parts. And if you try to pick it up by the handle, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna pick it up. But if you try to pick it up by the sharp parts, um, I'm just gonna have the program print, ouch, because uh, this isn't a game. But in a game, maybe you, you take a little damage or something. Um, and I'm going to be really um, general with what I consider the sharp part. So I'm just gonna consider just the entire um, blade part here, this whole thing. So what I did was um, I selected that and filled it in with red and this is 25500 so it's completely red red and everything else is whatever its original color was so this isn't going to be my axe image this is what i'm going to use to make a mask for the sharp parts of the mask so i've called this axe uh, thresholds pane. and what i'm going to do is subclass item um, and and create an item where when we have um, a handle mouse down, we check to see if 
you've clicked in that mask, which is the dangerous part. So I'm going to call it sharp item. Okay, so um, we've got sharp item, which is going to extend um, or specialize or be a subclass of item. And it's going to have just uh, one extra field, which is the sharp mask. Um, so in init, we're gonna call the superclass init and we're gonna pass in image X and Y. But we're also going to, when we construct this, pass in the threshold image. So um, after we have initialized it, which will do all of this, we're going to create a sharp mask. Oops. Now, what are we going to use for this? We're going to use the mask um, from threshold. So let's find that. Here it is. So what we can pass in is the surface and the color that we want to use to make the mask. And this is, I think, the default threshold, right? This is the default threshold. Um, so what we want to do is pass in a threshold. And um, let's see, so, so what, what Pygame is going to do with that is it's going to do I believe the absolute value of the difference between our image and whatever color we pass in. So I'm going to pass in red as my color because that's what I want for the mask. So it's going to do an absolute value of the difference. So when it subtracts red from red, it's going to get zero. But when it subtracts any of these other colors from red, uh, it's, it's going to get other colors, other, uh, or rather other values for RGB other than zero, right? So if, if we subtract zero minus 70 or 70 minus zero, the absolute value of that is 70, 83. So if I set a threshold of one, any other color when I subtract, it's going to be above the threshold. But the red from the red, when I subtract, I'm going to get all zero. So that's going to be below the threshold. So I'm going to pass in um, the surface, red, and then a threshold of 111. So the threshold image, that's what we've passed in. That's the axe with the red axe part. Here's red, and then here's the threshold. So only the parts that are less than one when I subtract basically red from the red parts. Okay, and then the other thing we wanna do is on mouse down, we're not going to just start moving. We're going to check to see if um, the sharp mask has been collided with or if it's another part. So we're going to check if, if click is within the sharp mask. So we're going to have to temporarily set our mask to the sharp mask. So let's uh, save that old mask the one that we created in the initializer, and set our mask to the sharp mask. And then we're gonna check. Okay, so if we tried to pick it up by the sharp part, we're just gonna print ouch. Again, in a game, you're probably gonna to wanna to do something different, like maybe take some damage. We're also not going to pick it up um, otherwise, We'll do the usual picking up, but we also are going to have to set our mask back once we're done. So self.mask equals old mask, because we don't want to leave it on the, um, on the sharp mask. Okay, so uh, hopefully that's good. Um, so what we want to do is create the axe and put it in the group. So create our sharp item. Okay, so Let's see. I'm going to make this um, ordered so that the axe will be on top, at least at first. So this is a subclass of group where the sprites are ordered by the order you put them in the group. So I'm going to put the axe in first. All right, let's see how we did. Okay, there's the ax, it should be on top. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna try grabbing it by the ax part. Okay, ouch. oh shoot, it's shrinking, I want it not to shrink. Okay, now I'm moving that, okay. 
Okay, so it's shrinking and I'm not resetting my masks. And let's just get rid of that because, um, so that's on handle mouse up. Let's override that. Um, so no longer moving, let's not scale. So we don't need to create a new mask or shadow or glow. Yeah, we shouldn't need to do any of that. Okay, try that again. Okay, so, ouch, ouch, ouch. Oh, what did I click on up there? Oh yeah, so it's glow looks a little weird. I'm not sure why, but, hmm. Okay, there's a spot there where I can grab it. But I made that red, so we'll have to look at that. Okay. What do I have to do with my... Oh, I didn't. <laughs> okay. Well, that explains that. That explains why you can grab it from there. Okay. So that's number four, overlapping with parts. Now, for number five, I'm going to go to my Tangram game because um, that's already written in the Tangram game. So let's go take a look at that. All right, so number five is calculating a percentage overlap. And in the Tangram game, the way I'm using this is I'm, I know it's messy. I'm pretending that this is the puzzle that we're trying to create with the Tangrams. So what I want is for this piece to snap into place if it overlaps sufficiently with the quote unquote puzzle. So overlapping a little, no effect. But if I overlap a lot, notice how it snaps down so it's completely on top of the other piece. And, um, oh yes, I've got, I've got the percentages over here. So I think I set it to 90. How do we do that? All right, so puzzle, the puzzle piece is itself a sprite. And the regular piece, when I release the mouse so that it's setting its location, I basically ask the puzzle, is this overlapping you enough that this should snap into place? And it'll send it a new location if it is. So let's look at that, get yeah, adjusted, wrecked. So this is actually slightly more complicated than what you saw because I was assuming a puzzle would be a list of pieces, which eventually it would be. Really, there's just one piece in our puzzle right now. So what this collided pieces is doing is checking to see if the shape that we were moving around collides with the piece in the puzzle. So it's going to be a list of the pieces of the puzzle that our shape has collided with, if any. So we're basically checking to see if the shape is over the puzzle and if it's sufficiently overlapped with one of the pieces that it should snap into place over that piece. But there is only one piece of the puzzle. So if there's a piece in collided pieces, it's that one gray triangle that you saw. So what I do is I have a mask, which is of the shape that we've been moving around. And then I create a mask of the piece that it's collided with. So that's the gray. And now it's just a matter of calculating the percentage of coverage. So I use overlap area, and that is going to return, well, let's take a look. That's going to return the number of overlapping set bits. So that's just a number, that's just an integer. So the area is the number of bits that overlap between our shape, the mask, and the piece that it's over. Well, unless we know the size of the shape, we don't know what that percentage is. So I do the same thing. I overlap the shape mask with itself. That'll be 100%, right? That's, that's the whole size. So if it's, let's say, 50 set bits, then I divide the number that were overlapped with the piece by the 50 set bits of the shape, and that will give me, a, when I multiply by 100, that will give me a percentage. And here I'm just setting a threshold of 90. We could set that to anything to decide if we want it to snap in place or not. I could set it to zero and just anytime you move it, it automatically snaps into place. Or I could make it even harder to make it snap into place. But the trick is to find out how many set bits there are in the mask to begin with, and then you can create a ratio of that to its overlap with another thing to decide what percentage you've overlapped. 
So that's the fifth thing that you can do with masks. And I think all of these are just so much fun and so useful. I hope that you enjoy them. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. And if you enjoy this sort of content, please subscribe to Design Code Debug Repeat. Have fun and keep coding.